Welcome back. Today, we're diving deeper into the world of long-term assets, specifically property plant and equipment, as well as intangible assets. So let's get started. Property plant and equipment, also known as fixed assets, are tangible assets that provide long-term benefits to an entity and used for production, supply, and administrative purposes. These assets play a crucial role in supporting business operations and are expected to contribute to the entity's success for more than one year. Fixed assets is initially measured at historical cost. This historical cost includes the net purchase price, along with directly attributable costs such as fees, delivery, and installation. Additionally, any interest related to the fixed assets acquisition, construction, or production is also included. However, it's critical to note that site preparation costs for a constructed building are not considered part of the historical cost. After the initial measurement, the subsequent measurement of PPE involves determining its carrying amount. This carrying amount is calculated by subtracting accumulated depreciation and impairment losses from the asset's historical cost. However, we should note that expenditures incurred after the initial recognition of PPE are classified as either capital expenditures or revenue expenditures. Capital expenditures are investments that enhance the asset's quality, extend its useful life, or increase its output. These expenditures are capitalized at cost, meaning they are added to the asset's carrying amount. On the other hand, revenue expenditures are regular expenses that maintain the asset's normal service capacity and are expensed as incurred. Depreciation is a vital concept in accounting for fixed assets. It involves allocating the depreciable base of an asset over its estimated useful life. The chosen depreciation method should reflect the expected pattern of economic benefits or services derived from the asset. Common depreciation methods include straight-line, usage-centered activity, such as units of output, and accelerated methods like declining balance and some of the year's digits. It's critical to note that land, due to its indefinite useful life, is not subject to depreciation. Understanding the concepts of subsequent measurement and depreciation sets the foundation for whether revaluation of assets under the revaluation model is appropriate. Revaluation is an accounting approach that provides entities with an alternative to the traditional cost model for valuing fixed assets. Under the revaluation model, an entity has the option to measure its PPE at fair value, which reflects the current market value of the asset. Revaluation is typically performed when the fair value of an asset significantly differs from its carrying amount. When an asset's fair value increases upon revaluation, the increase is recognized in other comprehensive income and accumulated in equity as a revaluation surplus. However, if the increase reverses a previous decrease recognized in profit or loss, it is also recognized in profit or loss. On the other hand, when an asset's fair value decreases, the decrease is recognized directly in profit or loss. If there is any credit balance in the revaluation surplus related to the same asset, it is applied to other comprehensive income. Now let's move to the last topic on PPE, which is investment property. Investment property is a type of property held for the purpose of earning rental income or achieving capital appreciation. It can be accounted for using either the cost model or the fair value model. Under the fair value model, an investment property is measured at its current fair value. Any gains or losses are recognized in the profit or loss statement. This allows for a more accurate representation of property value in financial statements. Now, let's look at intangible assets and how they contribute to business success. Intangible assets are non-physical assets that hold economic value and provide future benefits to a business. Examples include licenses, patents, copyrights, franchises, and trademarks. These assets provide businesses with exclusive rights, privileges, or advantages that enhance their market position and generate future economic benefits. When a company acquires intangible assets from external sources, such as purchasing licenses or patents, the initial accounting treatment involves recording these assets at their acquisition cost. This cost includes not only the purchase price but also any additional expenses directly related to the acquisition, such as legal or consulting fees. On the other hand, for internally developed intangible assets, only the additional costs incurred beyond research and development expenses are capitalized. Examples of common internally generated intangible assets include computer software, patents, trademarks, and copyrights. Research and development costs are generally expensed as they are incurred. However, there are certain limited scenarios where research and development costs can be capitalized. 
This occurs when specific criteria are met. There are two main types of intangible assets, identifiable intangible assets and unidentifiable intangible assets. Intangible assets with finite useful lives are subject to amortization. The carrying amount of an intangible asset with a finite useful life is determined by subtracting the accumulated amortization and any impairment losses from its historical cost. The second type of intangible assets is intangible assets with indefinite useful lives, such as goodwill. These assets are reviewed for impairment annually, or more frequently if there are indicators of potential impairment. And that concludes our discussion for today. Stay tuned for more valuable insights as we delve deeper into the world of financial management.